Uh, hello, good afternoon, uh, everybody. So first off, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Lisa Foquet. I am a research collaborator at Ghent Center for Digital Humanities. I'm really honored to be here. It's my first AAAF conference, first time in America, and first in-person conference giving a presentation. So yeah, a lot of first things. <laughs> thank you, thank you uh, very much. Um, so yeah, today I will share some of our experiences with using IIIF to teach digital humanities. I will give some practical examples and approaches of how uh, the Ghent Center of Digital Humanities try to do that. So first, let me say something about Ghent Center for Digital Humanities or Ghent CDH, which is, yeah, we obviously need a cool abbreviation for it. So um, we have four focus areas. Um, the list is right there. And we do support DH teaching practices at the Faculty of Arts and, Phil and Philosophy at Ghent University in Belgium. So this presentation will mostly focus on our first focus area, digital heritage and virtual exhibitions, and specifically how we try to integrate that into the teaching practices. So let me start by this image, which is uh, what I actually encountered a student do uh, in a classroom. Uh, you may perhaps see it, but it's a cropped up image, a screenshot of a AAA viewer pasted in words. So the students actually try to analyze poems uh, and then it was the poems were like hidden in a large periodical and they only wanted to see the poems and research it. But because they did not know wh what IIIF was, they kind of, yeah based it in words, which is obviously something we want to avoid. <laughs> so that's kind of the premise. Uh, digital competences, knowledge about IIIF are still not really integrated well into teaching practices, at least before again, CDH uh, tried to implement that it was not really integrated in, in the teaching practices. Um, so yeah, that's what we've been trying to do, actually integrate digital humanities within humanities scholarship, not seeing digital humanities as like a separate sub-discipline. So the, the courses that we taught, they were all humanities oriented. And uh, we've tried to gradually like implement digital techniques within those sort of more classic traditional courses. So that's kind of, yeah, the basis here where, where, what I will report on. So yeah, I, yeah, oh no, <laughs> indeed. So then we come to how to teach digital humanities. So oftentimes uh, we get stuck on the term, what is digital humanities? There are a lot of definitions and um, yeah, I, I would like to reflect on the quote provided on the right. I, would, I want to suggest that undergraduate students do not really care about digital humanities. They do not care about the whole reflection stage. Sometimes they just want to do a simple task, a simple digital task for which they need certain skill. And that's kind of uh, the approach that we have, have taken on. So do not just talk about DH. Um, yeah, kind of have a, have a debate about it, but don't merely talk about it. Actually have a, a hands-on approach, engage with tools and methods and learn something by actually doing it. So the question arises, what sh should we then teach when teaching DH? Um, and actually my colleague, Davy Verbeke, defines 15 transdisciplinary, di transdisciplinary digital competences, um, which you can see if, if you click on the link um, in the drive. Um, but they mostly, uh, I've kind of summarized some of them here on the slide. It's mostly using digital methods and or tools to dis discover historical sources, to capture uh, digital images, to collect material, to collaborate. Um, so yeah, those are some examples of, of what digital competence, uh, competences we try to integrate. So what, does, what, what are the benefits of IIIF or what role does IIIF have into this? So we all know the, use, the usual suspects. IIIF as a service provides standardized access to digital objects, uh, cite and share digital ob objects, display and storytelling possibilities and annotation, but also it kind of stitches together the technology for researchers. You can use it in multiple, to engage with multiple tools, um, and that's why it's very beneficial for the HS. 
and um, yeah, we we as we said, as I said, the digital competences were our main goal. We wanted to increase those digital competences. Teaching IIIF was not necessarily an end goal of us, but we did end up using IIIF. When well, looking back, we did end up using IIIF quite a lot during the teaching practices. So that's kind of what I will focus on now. So that's kind of the premise. How can IIIF support DH teaching and how to do it? So um, for this, I will uh, reflect on two scenarios. Uh, one creating virtual exhibitions with IIIF and Omica S, and the second one is enriching IIIF collections with Maddox. So um, I will first go through each of those two scenarios uh, on which we implemented the first one uh, in, in many more classes than the second one, but I will first go through each of those scenarios and then reflect on um, the students' perspective, how the students, what students thought of the assignments, did we actually achieve those digital competences, and um, what are our lessons learned, what can we do better? So that's kind of the structure. So the first scenario was creating virtual exhibitions with IIIF and Omica S, and I will um, focus on a case where we integrated Omica within the teacher education of uh, the Educational Master of Cultural Sciences at Ghent University. So our main goal was to increase digital competences um, for humanities students, but also for the next generation. And when you implement it into a teacher education case, case you actually hope that uh, the teachers of the future will also uh, implement those techniques uh, within the, the classrooms, within history classrooms of the, the high school. So um, Omeka S was our enabling platform. It's already been mentioned yesterday at the showcase as well. So we actually used Omeka S uh, instead of Omeka Classic. Um, and yeah, it's a, an open source platform. You all probably know, uh, have heard of it or know it. Uh, it's used to create, curate, and share digital collections and create virtual exhibitions. It's used by the glam sector uh, worldwide. Um, and it's sort of a content management web publication platform for digital objects. So uh, the IIIF server module in Omica S enables IIIF support and plugins for Universal Viewer Mirador uh, were developed that were developed by Daniel Bertero. They uh, also were integrated within the Omica platform. Um, and Omeka is already used worldwide for teaching practices, which made it a great case for us to try to experiment experience uh, with that platform. So what was our workflow? First, um, students had to choose a team um, on an assignment uh, which they wanted to work on. So they actually had to choose like um, uh, an interesting team and that was somehow related to Belgian traditions or a Belgian place, uh, so it, it really could be anything. Um, and then he had to find digital items in relation to that team. So finding digital items online, finding images was actually the first step. Then the next step, which is where uh, this workflow starts, was to add those digital items, which were often images, to Omeka S and um, add, use the Omeka S platform to add metadata, to add tags and to add mapping. And uh, the IIIF server actually um, enables that Omeka uses those images um, to generate a IIIF uh, on, on, on the Omeka server uh, after students have done that. So then students could use uh, the, the manifest URL um, to continue working on those images, uh, for example, in stories or in exhibits. So uh, after that, students created web pages and they used stories and or exhibits to create a uh, moving uh, sort of narrative. And uh, they were able to share their collection. So um, let me showcase what one of those results looked like after adding those items, uh, building those web page pages via the content blocks of Omeka. Um, this is a good case. Let me show you here. So yeah, you see here um, 
they they used both text and images to build a web page and stories uh, was integrated within omega s um through an inline frame which also omega s makes an easy platform to do that so they were actually able to combine like the the um the benefits of those triple if uh, stories um and uh yeah the benefits of omega s and then the presentation platform was uh, via Mirador um, with the metadata that was added by the students and the image uh, that was found and often also a link to the original institution. Oftentimes there was not IIIF available to directly ingest into Omeka S. So um, otherwise, if IIIF was available, the students directly ingested uh, the IIIF image within Omeka. But we found that was often not the case, or students had a hard time finding the IIIF manifest URL. Um, so that was kind of the first scenario that we implemented. So the second scenario was is enriching digital collections with Madoc, and this was in collaboration with Associate Professor, Associate Professor Marianne van Romorto. So uh, this reflects back to the, the, the image that I showed you uh, in the beginning uh, of poetry uh, in feminist periodicals. So uh, the Madoc platform, uh, that was uh, our main enabler for uh, for this classroom. It uh, it's developed by Gujarati and um, they're here <laughs> uh, and uh, funded by the universities of Ghent and Brussels and also the National Library of Wales. Maybe some more uh, institutions, uh, I'm not sure. Um, but um, it's completely open source. It, uh, the Medic platform allows you to import and reorganize IIIF manifests and or collections. And its main intention is to participatively enrich digital objects with metadata and annotations, which could be transcriptions, translations, keywords, and commentaries. And within the backend of Madoc, you can configure a customized capture model to kind of identify, okay, what information do I want and what do I need? So within this specific teaching case, uh, there was actually a uh, whole collection of feminist periodicals. So 19th century feminist periodicals. Um, and occasionally on a page, you could find like a poem within, within those periodicals. But it's kind of hard if you're only interested in poetry and, and like analyze that, that poetry to kind of know where to look. So you first actually have to identify all those poems before you even know uh, what you want to analyze, why this was important and what not. So the first step uh, which we did with the students was import IIIF manifests, which were all uh, periodicals, which were all different volumes. We imported them into Madoc. Um, so all the students were also actually ad uh, site administrators of the Madoc platform so that they had access to both the back end and the front end. And, um, and um, yeah, to kind of, which was needed to import the images and kind of uh, collaborate on how we will analyze uh, poetry uh, through Madoc. So the second step after importing them all was uh, we created a project in Madoc and uh, we used the capture model to identify the poem in the periodical through a bounding box and annotate the title and the author of the poem. So uh, this is what it looked like uh, in the back end, the capture model. And this is what it looked like in the front end, what, which the students did. They annotated uh, the poem, um, identified the title, and identified the author. They had the option to add another author, which was sometimes needed because poems could have multiple authors. Um, and yeah, that was kind of uh, the first main assignment. So after identifying all those poems, the students were able to uh, browse through those annotated poems, uh, browse through the collections and actually kind of see, okay, we have all this poetry now, we know where to look for. Um, and they, after the, the next step was to choose three to five poems for an in-depth analysis. And that was kind of a harder step. Uh, it's how, how could we use Maddox to actually analyze those poems? It was really hard because all the students wanted to do different things with the poems, wanted to have another take uh, on the analysis. It was kind of hard to find one consistent data model or, or capture model to actually analyze those poems. Um, 
So um, the solution to that was is that each student created their own project within Mano, Madoc uh, and uh, needed to think of a custom capture model um, to analyze the three to five poems they had chosen. And it was only one capture model for three to five poems instead of one consistent model for 70 poems or something. And uh, another solution was that we used the HTML content blocks uh, in Madoc for general reflections and to sort of create a virtual exhibition using the Madoc platform. So uh, let me showcase what the result of that was. So this is uh, an actual site. I'm, I'm not sure it's public. Um, I don't think so, um, but let me demo it. So this was the front page they com came up with use some content blocks to add, add HTML to it. These are the different projects of each of the students. And when you click on one project, you see that they've added more content blocks to analyze those poems. And um, then you can see that the, the tree or periodicals which they chose, which all contain the poems, you can click on them. And um, then you can actually see that the analysis which they did. Uh, so you see the annotated poem and on the left-hand side is sort of the capture model that they made um, in order to analyze the poem. So that was kind of uh, the, the whole assignment um, that we, yeah, that we did uh, within Madoc. Um, and yeah, uh, that was only five students. So we don't have actually any data or surveys on how they found it, but uh, most of them said that they found it great, that it was a practical assignment, that they got to know the platform um, and actually also helped kind of contribute to Madoc because they uh, they were able to give their own experience on what works well, what did not work well, what should we focus on and what not. And we actually used their inputs uh, for further developments uh, in Madoc in, in the next months. So yeah, that's sort of the, that was the end result. Um, and finally, let me reflect on, can we teach uh, on the question, can we teach digital humanities using IIIF? It will mostly be reflections on the first scenario, just because we've implemented the Omeka case a lot more and we have a lot more data and we have undertaken some surveys um, to those students. Uh, but I believe that those reflections are also uh, quite, uh, Word words uh, are yeah are all can also be used for the the Madoc project. I believe it's not so different. So what are the experiences? Uh, so you had we had a lot of students who actually found it a very positive assignment. So I found it very positive that the assignment combines combines both research competencies and digital competencies. It gave teachers and students the opportunity to get creative and there was a sense of practice. So uh, we did not, uh, they, they actually often liked that we integrated both the digital and the research competences and did not see them as separate. Um, others said that indeed it would, that uh, more students would benefit from an exam assignment like this. And, and a recurring thing was that it's more than just writing a paper in words as we have to do so many times before. It's uh, to actually also think about, okay, what if we're presenting this paper to a wider public, use HTML, uh, those sort of basic things, use images, combine images and text, sort of uh, the basic things. And that it was also a clear reminder of the importance of digital, digital skills needed as a teacher. Um, and yeah, that's also uh, indeed reflecting to one of the pitfalls. Uh, where some students struggled with the assignment was mostly because they experienced technology as something overwhelming. And they found that uh, using the platform, those digital competences and those research competences were actually sometimes quite a lot of information in one time. Um, and another student said that I'm not good at digital and I don't like doing it. And yeah, it's really, <laughs> that's really hard to motivate the students who, yeah, who don't like it, but uh, those, those were some of the pitfalls uh, which we experienced. So the next question is, did we actually um, achieve some digital competences, uh, which we had predetermined and we've kind of, okay, this assignment should deliver those competences and this uh, and that we've kind of made an analysis, an analysis before. 
but um, we asked the students to a survey. Uh, there were 32 participants to indicate by a slider uh, which competences were achieved. Um, and zero was not achieved, 50 was sufficiently, and 100 was largely. And we see that uh, the capture, uh, capturing digital items, creating a digital version, collecting digital items, making a collection, enriching those items, visualizing and presenting digital uh, um, my material uh, in a digital way or using digital methods and collaborating uh, were the most, uh, were the five most um, digital competencies which they indicated that they had achieved. To a lesser extent, um, those five competencies came up, so around uh, between 50 and 59 probably, was this using digital um, platforms to discover sources, source criticism and the digital term, uh, using modeling techniques to make relations between digital objects, uh, cleaning up data and using digital platforms to actually share collections with other people. The share uh, was mostly because due to copyright restrictions, we could not actually share their work with a wider public, uh, which was actually, yeah, uh, which is, uh, yeah, one of the continuous like pitfalls of those projects is, is that you have to deal with copyright. So yeah, most of those uh, virtual exhibitions remained uh, under a password and not visible to the public. So um, to a lesser extent, uh, we see that not sufficiently those digital competences were, I would say, maybe not really achieved. It was uh, auto use digital methods to automate processes, to analyze sources, or yeah, because it was not really a data analysis, more a presenting task um, to store. Uh, and then the two meta uh, reflection, um, competences were VH reflection, reflection and society and ethics and how the digital turn uh, fits into society. And yeah, so they indicated that as uh, uh, achieved by a lesser extent or. or um. So um, what should we look out for uh, when trying to teach digital humanities and trying to use IIIF? So uh, it's actually my colleague, Davy Verbeker, um, who made a SWOT analysis specifically for teaching with Omega S, but I think it could also be applied to, to teaching with, uh, with IIIF or teaching with IIIF enabled platforms such as Madoc, is that the strengths are that it's multifunctional, open source. Um, so I, I put the, um, I put in bold what I believe, what I think the benefits of IIIF are instead of the, uh, What's not in bold is the benefits mostly of sites such as Madoc or, or as Omeka. So multifunctional, open source, user-friendly, you can add metadata, it's modular, you can add embedded content and compliant with link, linked open data. Some of the weaknesses specifically for Omeka is that a lot of modules are still in development um, and design is not always uh, so easy to get right into Omeka, especially if you don't have any experience uh, what are the opportunities is that you can, uh, yeah, uh, introduce students to digital literacy, use blended learning techniques, you can get them equated with techniques such as digital storytelling, and there's also clear connection to the job market, so a lot of the students who actually will wind up or, or want to uh, work in the cultural heritage sector um, will probably use uh, Omeka or IIIF, widely used by that sector. So I think connection to a job market is a really big opportunity that was stressed also during those assignments. And other opportunities are you can either use it integrally or partially, or you can do it to replace an assignment or also as a sort of an additional way to um, an, uh, give it like a, to do an additional assignment. Um, so you have multiple ways of integrating it within, uh, within your course. 
And there's also um, the benefit of peer learning. So in those platforms such as Omeka or Madoc, students could actually look at each other's work and learn from each other. They, uh, there, was, there were no restrictions as in, oh, you have your own page and you can't look at anyone else's. No, uh, we actually encourage, encourage students to work together, learn from each other, see the pages of other people. And uh, yeah, that's also was also a great opportunity. So the recurring threats were the digiphobia. Uh, just, yeah, I don't like digital. I don't like doing it. It was often, an often recurring thing. Um, and uh, appendicitis, which um, was the word that my colleague, uh, David Baker, said, uh, which means seeing it as sort of a, uh, uh, can't get the word right. Um, yeah, like a necessary assignment without having any actual benefits. Uh, or it's like, oh, it's necessary, we have to do this for school, for the uni, um, whatever. <laughs> Connection to the job market, it's whatever. <laughs> and yeah, what's, uh, some of the other threats were unclear is a relation criteria, providing no feedback. And also a really important one is no in-person training sessions. It's not because it are digital platforms that you can just use those digital platforms and not have training sessions. We actually found that students need those in-person training sessions um, in order for the assignment to succeed. And also, yeah, copyrights uh, often an issue. So that was, there were kind of our findings. Um, thank you for listening. Um, those are my contact uh, numbers and the contact number of my colleagues. Uh, for, yeah, without them, I would not have been here. <laughs> so uh, really grateful for all of them. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. Um, yeah. Any other questions? If there are any questions, hi, just a, just a small one. Uh, I think digiphobia, definitely. Like that's one of the biggest things with, with the students. I mean, certainly for, you know, younger people to have to learn something so complicated and so new, it, it's usually a painful process. Uh, do you think for these history students that might've been helped if you coupled them with like computer science students or just as a teacher in general, do you think that would help with it at all? It's actually an idea that I have never thought about, but I think I think it could be. It, I think it's it it could be very helpful. Although I don't know. I actually don't know. I, and neither does my university. <laughs> uh, uh, most of the time, when it comes through, it's either a group of computer science students trying to do something, and then a group of history students trying to do something. And it's just it's hard in the university to get the university to say. Well, let's just cross that and just yeah. let those let it be interdisciplinary. I, I actually think it would be very beneficial because even in the group assignments, when one person was really good at a Mecca, for example, we often found that oh, they completed a whole digital assignment, and the peers who were not really involved, they just focused on the content. So I think in those group assignments, you also divide like the digital tasks and sort of the more humanities related tasks. So I think that that could be helpful to put those two groups together. I'm interesting. Yeah. One more question. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be completely addressed here, but I, I think it's interesting how much of the stuff where you talk about with students is also useful for uh educating people who maybe are very well established in traditional research but have not done digital yeah. research and uh there's definitely changes you have to make when you're trying to deal with somebody who is uh you know has, has already published a monograph and you're trying to convince them that this might be something else that they can add uh but i think that the digiphobia comes in the same way um, but sometimes the attitudes can be very different. Uh, so I don't know mm -hmm. if you've had any experience or if you have any ideas about how you might be able to change that from sort of students to uh, researchers. Yeah, um, so we do offer some of the training 
also to teachers and to peers. And obviously we've tried to integrate them into the humanities teaching practices by talking to professors and uh, by sort of providing those tools. So, oh, we could uh, implement this within your course. So that's kind of the way we went about it. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not yet widely spread as well. So um, I think a lot of the, of, of the SWOT analysis is also applicable to researchers and kind of have to go in a similar way, like stress those opportunities uh, in sort of to counter those threats and provide good support, provide user-friendly manuals. So like the, the SWOT analysis for teaching with Omega S is actually intended for teachers and intended for researchers or professors to sort of have a user-friendly overview uh, in Dutch uh, about the benefits of Omega S and also uh, triple IS uh, in that. So, yeah. That's great. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> A quick request before we uh, bring the next folks up, um, but if you're in the last block, we need your presentations in the Google Drive folder. So uh, to put you on the spot, Ron Snyder, Laura Morreale, Sean Gilsdorf, um, we, uh, yeah, get it in the Google Drive. And if you don't have that link, Slack one of us and we'll, we'll work it out. Okay. But up next, we have Matt Begratton talking about uh, linking TEI, XML, and AAAF. So, so just press and show if you need to go back to your... Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, it's the wrong one. <laughs> I've lost my... Yeah, there we go. You know what you're doing. <laughs> the glasses so I can even see what I'm doing. Um, so, yeah, today I'm talking about the way... Uh, one particular approach to linking together text in the form of TEI XML transcripts with IIIF uh, using kind of crowdsourcing techniques, but with, this is experts that are doing this and using IIIF change discovery, which is one of the newer IIIF specifications as a way of linking together unconnected systems. So kind of doing loose coupling between an environment that people might use for discovering content and one that people might use for annotating and creating content. So using that specification to enable that kind of linking together. So I'm gonna talk about the role of IIIF in the project. I'm gonna show a discovery interface that we built for this project that would enable the kind of comparison that the the project stakeholders wanted to be able to do. I'll talk a bit about TEI XML and how that fed into the project about Maddox, which um, Lisa mentioned already, but which we used as the kind of hook for the crowdsourcing element of this project, and then how change discovery brings those two things together. So the core use case, the project, the, the, the people who came to us to do this work originally, is they're, they're interested in a particular Zoroastrian religious text it has lots of witnesses in many different libraries all over the world. Some of these are really big libraries like the British Library and the Bodleian and so on. Some are really tiny, there are temples in North India and places like that that don't have any IT infrastructure. What they wanted to be able to do was to bring together transcripts of these particular manuscripts and they're all different, so they, they have different uh, sort of texts with digitized images in one kind of environment where people could then explore and compare these multiple witnesses to the same text. Um, what I'm talking about today, though, is not this final prototype for this project. Um, that project's currently in a kind of alpha testing phase with them, and it will go live later in the year. Instead, what I'm doing is just looking at the, the approach to the workflows, the way that we use IIIF, the processes that were used to realize that prototype, and I put together a demo for this, this uh, presentation using a completely different set of content, not the, the original content for the project. So we've got two kinds of information in the project. We've got transcripts and we've got digitized manuscript images. What do we do to bring these two things together in the middle? The thing about the transcripts were, is we couldn't create these alongside the IIIF. There wasn't gonna be some workflow in which people would be transcribing IIIF based resources. The transcripts were TEI XML. They already existed. In some cases they were created years ago because there's been a fairly long standing project to transcribe this content. So this is a kind of fixed point. We had this TEI XML. We couldn't change the format or structure of that data. The TEI XML 
was well understood by the domain experts. They were used to working with this format. They understand how to use it. So we were going to be using TEI XML, whatever, right? So we, that was a sort of fixed point. There's TEI transcripts of these manuscripts. What do we do about bringing them together with the IIIF? On the other hand, for the images, there was already some IIIF that existed for some of these manuscripts at the British Library, at the Bodleian, at the KB in Copenhagen, and in some other places. But there was also the opportunity to create new IIIF from digitized images where that IIIF didn't exist. So IIIF was like the obvious format of choice for this type of resource, right? I mean, I'm talking at a IIIF conference, of course it was, but, but, but there was lots of good reasons for us to be doing that anyway, right? So the question then is, what should we build? Right? What do we put in the middle between these two sets of existing resources, TIXML with transcribed text and IIIF with the digitized images of, the, of these manuscripts? We had some key requirements People, the users of the site had to be able to view these images, you know, deep zoom, those types of things, do side-by-side -side image comparisons so they could compare more than one manuscript witness to the same text, and also to be able to combine images and text and see these together in some way. So to be able to explore through image and through text. These are kind of familiar requirements, right? So these are like core IIIF use cases. These go right back to the very first IIIF conferences when everyone was sitting in, in the Parker Library in Cambridge in 2011, these were the use cases that were being discussed then, right? It was, how do we compare two things? How do we put text and image together? So this is straight in the middle of IIIF's kind of core uh, feature set, right? It's the, it's the basis of the image API and the presentation API. So uh, can we just create some IIIF manifests, throw them in the Mirador of the Universal Viewer, and that's our job done, right? It's not really as simple as that. It's all about process and workflow in this case. It's not so much about data modeling. Right? So the requirement was to bring together pre-existing TEI and IIIF, but also how can we make use of document structure to navigate IIIF resources? You know, I want to see this chapter of this book and this verse in this manuscript and this chapter and this book and this verse in that manuscript. I don't want to have to do that by paging through a thousand pages to find the page that I want. How do we model this in IIIF? And how do we kind of leverage IIIF in the workflow that we're using? And I think we can kind of split apart two things that we can do with IIIF, right? So one is IIIF as a data model, as a, as a kind of carrier for information, right? And I'm not gonna go into the technical detail about the IIIF side of this too much. I think a lot of this audience is familiar with it. These are key parts of the IIIF presentation API specification, but we can use ranges and structures to model the structure of these manuscripts, the intellectual structure of this document, to provide navigable elements that people can then use to go through this document and land in the right place. And we can use annotations and see also as two mechanisms to link together text and data with images via IIIF canvases. Right? So IIIF here is a really good fit for that data modeling problem. But also increasingly, we can use IIIF as a kind of process enabler Right, so we've got IIIF change discovery now as a specification that gives you a standard way of discovering what changes have happened to IIIF in some, in, in some source of information. Right, I want to go and find out what things have been annotated yet, which things are ready for me to import into my discovery environment, which things are ready to be indexed into search and so on. And I can do that with change discovery. I do not have to write some custom API to do that. And also, I want to have a viewer that I can bring up and show this thing beside that thing at the same time. And IIIF content state gives you a really good way of representing that too as a kind of process. So in this case, IIIF is like a key enabler for this, this process. TEI, on the other hand, can provide us with the transcript text itself, but it can also provide us with the structure of the document. We can work out which book this is, which chapter this is, which verse it is, and extract from that TEI the kind of abstract structure of the document from the markup that's already present. So what did we do? We wanted to bring these things together just using an annotation process. We wanted experts to be able to go into Maddox as a crowdsourcing environment and link the IIIF elements, this particular canvas or this region of a canvas with this element in the TEI via some kind of simple autocomplete interface. We didn't want anyone to be exposed in that crowdsourcing platform to either 
triple IF in the form of JSON or whatever, or the TEI XML directly. Instead, we want to give them a list of books, versions, chapters, and so on that they can select from in some nice, easy way, and then link it all together. So what do we build? Well, we took a just uh, we built a discovery environment that uses change discovery to bring data in. We use the triple IF content state to initialize the, the viewer and make reusable URIs that can be that can be done seen in various places that would support comparison. We wanted it to be agnostic about metadata. We didn't know what the metadata would be attached to these triple IF resources. It could come from anywhere. And uh, we also wanted search to be flexible. We wanted to be able to find things irrespective of the format that the metadata was in in those particular things. We needed to store TEI and convert it into a format that we could display alongside the triple IF. And we built an autocomplete API so we could extract elements of the TEI structure to seed send to a, a transformation environment so that someone could select the right TEI identifier without having to actually interact with any of the XML. So I'm going to give a quick demo of a few things and then come back to some more slides. There are some videos, but I'm going to do some of this as a live demo instead. So I will go to the discovery environment. So this isn't wildly different from anything anyone else has seen before. There are lots of discovery environments out there that people have built around IIIF resources. This is the one that was built for that project, although this is not the particular project branding on it. But I've brought in some IIIF resources here, mostly from the Bodleian. The reason for that is there is a thing called a IIIF registry where you can put in change discovery streams. They've published theirs. So I just hooked it up and just said, bring me everything from the past year or so. And it brought it all in automatically without me having to do anything with it. Uh, and then I've got faceted search and browse. I want to find things from Western medieval manuscripts collection where the language is Latin, for example, and I can do a refine and it will do a little search and I will get my list of things. Oh, 205 in this case. So, and I can go and view an item in the usual way and it will bring up Mirador and display the, the, the uh, metadata for this thing write statements and so on. But one big difference between this and some other ones is I might want to do some comparison. So I'm going to pin some things to my little shopping basket of stuff that I want to look at by just clicking this pin item button. And if I look at the top of the screen, I can see which things I've pinned. I've got three things pinned here. I can view them in my little basket. This is the three things that I've pinned. And I sort of say, oh, I want to just look at these two. And then I can do a comparison and it will load them both up. And I can do them here. Look at this. There's a blank space on the right here. That's for transcript text and so on that usually appears in this case. But it's using a slightly early version of Triple F content state. There's a slight, um, if I go here to base64 decode and just drop in the URL, part of the URL that was there, what it decodes to is a blog, blog of JSON, which is a triple F content state thing that says, load these two manifests. And that's completely uh, like standard. And there's a, there's a little copy and paste button here. I can copy this link, go to another view, hit paste it in, and I'll take me back to the same two things and I can see them again somewhere else. So this was the kind of discovery environment that we made. If I look at the admin UI for this, you will see that there is a set of change discovery streams that have been registered here. This is quite small, I'll make it bigger. But there's one from Maddox, which I'll show in a few minutes. There's one from a little experimental Git uh, gist that I put together, and one from the Bodleian. And it, I've told it how often to synchronize. So from the Bodleian, it's doing it every couple of days. From Maddox, it's every 10 minutes or so. And it will just pull those, look for new content, and when it finds them, import them into the system, and then they'll be part of the part of this. So that's the kind of basics for the discovery UI that we made. On the TEI side, I'll go back to the presentation. What we're interested in is making the TEI XML available as APIs that could be consumed by something else. So, you know, we weren't re really interested in building TEI management and editing tooling. Um, they already had some good tooling that was, that was built for the project already, that had been built before we even came on board on the project. They, they were very experienced at creating this. What we what, wanted to think about was how can we use it in our workflow? So. What we did was use the TEI as the source of the structural elements within the manuscript. So this is where the book boundaries are. 
chapters, verses, and so on. This is the identifiers that are being used. But also, we could then extract that and get text from those, those to use in the discovery UI to display alongside the content. And the structural elements were provided as an autocomplete endpoint for tagging resources in Maddox. I'm going to skip over this. This is more detail about what we, what we did. I've got some links here. These are just very quick. So there is a little um, autocomplete endpoint so that a, a Maddox instance can find all of the TEI documents that are available for autocompletion. This particular demo instance only has one, but the live project has many. They have one for each of the manuscript witnesses. So when you're tagging a document, you can say, this is the TEI XML that I want to use as the source for my, my stuff. Um, when the TEI is provided as an API, it has a kind of autocomplete endpoint. So if you look at the end of this link here, I've got gen.1, because I built some TEI for the Bible. Uh, so that, that's Genesis chapter one. And it gives me all identifiers in here for the TEI XML for every verse in Genesis chapter one. But I could change this over, Exodus one, and I'll get the same thing, right? And these can be fed into Maddox for crowdsourcing and all these identifiers map back to the TEI XML so that I know when I select that I'm annotating this content with this identifier that I can then fetch the TEI content and that's too much better. So if I go into Maddox, talking about Maddox. So Maddox, as uh, Lisa was saying earlier, is a kind of crowdsourcing environment. Um, it, what it normally does is it imports IIIS and it makes a kind of shallow copy of that manifest so that you can annotate it even if it's not your stuff. Um, and you can add that manifest to one or more projects and then it can be annotated. I've got some videos of that happening, but I might skip them because they're, well, I'll show this a little bit here. I used the Biblissima manuscript portal to find some Gutenberg Bibles. And then I just dropped them into Maddox from where they came from. In this case, this one's John Ryland's, I think. And I import that content. Oh, as soon as this happens, I'll skip this because it's a quite a long video. But it brings that in and I can import that content. And I then added the one from the Rylands. We did this, I did the same thing for this project with um, Gutenberg Bibles from the Rylands, but also from the Bodleian, from uh, the, the uh, two libraries in France, a bunch of them. Uh, so inside Maddox, someone can select one of these, choose the autocomplete endpoint from the TEI that they want to use to tag it, and then they can select regions on the canvases or whole canvases and mark it up. So I have that short video of me doing that here. So this is, this is from the John Rylands. I've got some TEI for the Bible here, so I'm going to go and find the folio I'm interested in. This is a Gutenberg Bible. I want to contribute to this. And this is all triple IF here. And now at this point, I don't need to know anything about the TEI. I can just type in here Exodus. And it asks me, is, it, is this the book? So I've tagged it with Exodus. This is the start of the book, Exodus. And then I can add another section. And this time I want to tag book one, chapter one, verse one. And it will auto complete and it's a verse. It's getting this information from the TEI XML on the back end. So it's no, it knows that there is an identifier in the TEI, which is Exodus 1.1. And then when I'm making this annotation, draw the box around it and confirming it, it's then associating this IIIF resource with this piece of TEI XML that's, that's elsewhere on the site. So I'm going to skip the video now because it's getting... There's also a review workflow, which is that there's a video in the, in the presentation showing how you can then review and approve these. The model that they use on this project is that it's only when every page in this manuscript has been annotated and the annotations have been, have been approved by a reviewer that it will be published into the change discovery feed. But for my demo, I just plugged it straight out with a couple of pages annotated. I don't need to do the whole thing. The basic process is there's a Maddox instance, and then there's a discovery environment instance, and they're connected together. Where these two arrows are is basically a change discovery um, request. The, the front end, the discovery UI is polling Maddox, and it's publishing a change discovery feed with all of the annotations that have been created and all the triple IF has been updated. And when the discovery environment finds any of these, it fetches them, it pulls them in, 
that then indexes all of those annotations into search. So you can search for things by content, but it also transforms those annotations into ranges. So the manifest don't have ranges at this point, but it builds a table of contents as triple S ranges from the annotations that have been created so that the manifests that come out will be interoperable. You can use those ranges elsewhere. Um, and then text display within the discovery UI, it will show text if it has it from the TEI XML. It doesn't store the, the text in annotations that it uses on the display side. That was a, a, a choice because the, the text that the actual project want to display has a lot of complex formatting, color coding and so on. So what we actually display is HTML alongside the IIIF. The annotation is just vanilla content, but it's, it's here. This is the workflow. So we've got important TI XML into discovery. This goes into Maddox. We annotate it in Maddox. It gets reviewed. When the reviews are published, automatically it's published to a change discovery feed and then it's pulled into the discovery UI for uh, exploration. So this is the final part of my presentation, really, apart from a quick demo. The, the change discovery. If I go back to the discovery environment now, and I'll just back to normal size, I'm going to empty my box. So there is a, a little control at the top here that selects from all of the possible books that are in that TEI XML. Uh, and I want to look for Exodus. And it finds three results because I annotate three things with Exodus in, in, in the front. So you can see there are three different Gutenberg Bibles here. They all look slightly different, although they're, they're the same print, but the illuminations are different. I want chapter one, verse one, and it will find me my three kind of witnesses to Exodus 1.1. 1, 1. And again, I can now uh, add these to my little comparison basket. And I can hit compare and it will bring them all up. This, the delay here is it's fetching the images from the IIIF services. But also, it will hit the TEI. It's found all this stuff to the to the right. This is all the empty, because I didn't add transcripts to most of the elements of this Bible because I was doing it myself. But if I scroll down, there is on one of these, if I go, I'll have to view one of these at a time. If I go back, maybe I just view one. If I go to the Bodleian one, for example, you'll see it's brought in the text. So there's the Latin text and the English text that's color coded. That's come from the TEI XML and it's just being brought in and shown alongside the IIIF because they share the same identifier. So there's an identifier in the TEI XML, identifier in the IIIF, and that's what it's used to bring the two together on the page. Going back to the presentation, kind of challenges. Things that worked really well, IIIF was a really good fit for all the data modeling side and for the process side of things. And Maddox, the tool, worked well for the annotation creation and for the basic review and approval workflow. Um, and synchronizing the two together with triple F change discovery was pretty painless and it worked, it worked nicely. Challenges really were how much we make this a kind of generalizable platform and how much it was specific to just the particular TEI XML and the particular project requirements for the, the, the funder for this project. We kind of ended in a slightly awkward place between two of those things. So the front end is quite specific to their, to their use. You know, the navigation by book, chapter and verse and so on is very tailored to the particular data model of the project that they had. But the underlying APIs are much more flexible and extensible. So it's pretty easy to change this and, and customize it for different types of content. Um, TEI obviously is a pretty big, expansive standard. There's lots of different ways you can use it. So the site is quite opinionated about what, what the TEI should look like. And that's largely based around what the TEI for this particular project looked like. Um, it's pretty flex flexible about how it handles transcript text uh, and it does quite a lot of powerful things with that text, but it's quite opinionated about identifiers. It expects identifiers to look a certain way. Uh, that could be changed, but for this project, it expects it to look a certain way. Kind of conclusions are IIIF works really well for this kind of thing, especially change discovery and content state alongside the presentation and image APIs that you can bring together IIIF with TEI XML, which is a kind of format that scholars actually use, you know, it's got huge investment, lots of great stuff's been done with TEI XML. And the annotation environments of whichever kind can be a powerful glue to bring those two things together without having to expose people to the nitty gritty of either the TEI XML or the uh, IIIF.
Merci pour lui. <laughs> uh, question. Bravo. Thanks very much. Uh, great to see. And um, I think you started, and you may have answered this just for clarification. You started by saying the TEI was already in place. Yeah. So, how much of your experiment suggested? Maybe changing and improving TEI for better incorporation in the future. Um, we didn't really have that opportunity. I think you know there was a lot of this was quite a long running project. We came in quite a long way through the project. They had built tooling to enable to create the TEI XML. They had trained up people to create the TEI, TEI XML. They had made uh, editions of many of these manuscripts in that way. Luckily, I think the way that they had chosen to do it was actually quite friendly to us. They had used fairly unique identifiers. There is a shared identifier scheme for all these manuscripts that's not just used by this project, but by other projects that study the same corpus texts. So um, in that sense, we, we were in a fairly good place. So yeah, we didn't have to, do, working with the TEI was, was uh, you know, we, we, we had some limitations, but it wasn't especially painful. Actually, we, we, that wasn't, wasn't too bad. So. Thank you. A question um, regarding the transcription um, part of it in the TEI. So as, as I understood, the TEI XML transcript text gets transformed into an HTML document within the manifest that is referenced and then rendered on the page, or, or how does that work specifically? No, um, what, what, what I think that's a probably show an example, but it, it won't be, I've got a link somewhere. The only problem is there's not a good JSON format on this browser. So the the, the result looks a bit nasty. <laughs> we actually parse it into a big JSON structure that reflects the structure of the original TEI. So their TEI is quite complex. If I, if I put this in something like JSON lint so you can see it, um, there are all of these child elements. You know, there, 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 there are different types of punctuation marks. There are different, you know, they've got books and chapters and so on, but now there are, you know, this is a ritual direction or this, this is a gap that they've got very complex TEI and we've, we've parsed that and stored it as JSON. The original XML is also stored, but as part of that parsing, when we parse the, the um, XML and create the JSON, we also create an HTML representation of it that's stored here. And you can, if they, if they update the XML or update this JSON, it would update the HTML rendering. And that's what we display alongside the image because it had particular formatting requirements that were not they weren't a good fit for a standard web annotation. We wanted to something slightly different, but we can also serialize it out as a web annotation in this plain text. In fact, right at the top of this massive thing, this is one verse in this book, by the way. So it's a very, <laughs> there's a lot, of, the TEI is very complex, but there is a plain text representation right at the top here, which I've just highlighted. It's not very, but you know, so we that, that can be turned into an annotation like that. That's a very simple thing to do. But we had display requirements that went beyond just plain text, so we used HTML. Thank you. Time for one more question, if there is one. Seeing none. All right. Uh, thanks, Matt. You're welcome. All right, up next, uh, we have uh, Stefano Kasu and David Newberry from the Getty um, talking about Use Me, progressive integration of, in of AAAF with new software services. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all. The, we're here to talk really about the work that we've been doing in AAAF over the past um, five or six years at Getty. Um, so we've been at the Getty, we've been working using AAAF for about the past six years. Um, 
you know, we uh, Bob Sanderson was part of the team at Getty, you know, and brought it to our attention along with Daniel Sussman. Um, we'd originally implemented this, and what we'd really like to do in this conversation is talk about what we've learned um, as and to sort of share out what we've done here. You know, Getty's in an interesting place um, for many reasons, but among them that we're we're a museum, we're a library, uh, we do exhibitions, we run you know interesting digital projects, um, and we're a publisher and. Those are all places that use images really, really heavily. Um, and so there's lots of different ways that we can take IIIF and see what you could do with it as a technology. Also, Getty really thinks of itself as a place that's not just you know, presenting those materials out, but really serving as a laboratory. Um, the mission is really visual arts for the world and support for the field. And so being able to share back really fits into that mission of what we do. So as I said, we originally implemented IIIF back in 2016, 2017. We had a level zero implementation at the museum. There was another implementation at the archives. Uh, Rob was leading using Loris. Um, but as we sort of started looking at what we wanted to do, we took those implementations and said, you know, these are two implementations. There's probably six or seven other places in the organization that we need IIIF. We need to take a step back and talk about how we do this as a whole organization, not as a series of projects within different silos. Um, that's a that was a big project, um, required a lot of sort of technical development and architecture. And Stefano really here has been sort of the the brains and architecture behind that sort of architecture that we've done around IIIF, integrating with a lot of the data work that we've done. I can't speak to it as eloquently or as completely as he can, so he's going to do that. <laughs> And now the unescapable architecture diagram. <laughs> um, I kind of broke them up in, in little pieces, so I, I was stuck with this comma, and uh, uh, we'll put them together um, at the end. So uh, this is something that many of you might uh, identify with. So we have a lot of uh, data sources, very different data sources, most of which we don't have control over. Some of them have nice APIs, some of them have less nice API. Some, some of them don't have an API at all, and we have to figure out creative ways to, to get data out of them. Uh, one of the main problems of these systems is that uh, some of them, they don't really work well in a you know, distributor or uh, high availability uh, environment. Uh, so we had to uh, build a, a layer that protects the systems from going down and having our content managers sit on their hands for half a day until you know we would take them back up. Uh, this is what uh, what we call the, the level one cache uh, does. Uh, it's a set of uh, um, transformer code. Uh, we are a Python shop. And by the way, disclaimer, I can claim only a very small part of this architecture. I'm part of a team that uh, does the, the triple F and link up linked open data uh, software architecture. Um, so, uh, these transformers put uh, a very rough uh, translation of the source data uh, that's plain JSON. It's very close to the source, so we can actually inspect the, the source data if we to find problems in the data sources. And at the same point, it, it provides this layer of protection uh, against against um, system failure and an overload. Um, next, we have uh, another set of uh, transformers that actually apply uh, the, the content models that we have agreed on uh, at Getty Digital. Uh, we use linked arts for the linked open data uh, in, you know, data, and of course, you know, triple F manifest. That's that's where things happen. Uh, so uh, there is a, another set of transformers that are uh, orchestrated by what we call Task Manager, uh, which is a, a Python. Um, Celery application, which is it's a it's an event driven um, software that basically uh, acts on on ex external events. So when there is something, something is updated somewhere, uh, the, the the task manager li uh, listens for uh, a feed of events and uh, triggers actions that cascade into other other systems that you know updates the systems uh, recursively. And uh, then we have the public facing uh, part, which uh, we call the LOD gateway. And there, as, as you can see, there are uh, several gateways for different parts of our, our data, but they all uh, federate into, uh, into a common data source. So we can actually perform sparkle queries, for example, across 
the very repositories, which is uh, we have uh, one for the vocabulary, which we will have one for the media, which is just the media metadata, technical metadata about media, one for the museum collection, uh, annotations of all sorts. Now, we, we, I think it's, we're just at the beginning for that. Uh, uh, and the one for the research collection viewer, uh, which is uh, the um, KDE Research Institute uh, collections. Uh, each of these units has a, a triple star that, uh, as I said, we can uh, uh, perform Sparkle queries against, or we have a simple REST API where you can pull uh, JSON-LD from, and also an activity screen feed. And finally, we get to the triple F part. So uh, what uh, what's called GCIS in, in Getty Shared Image Services? Getty Common Image Services, I, I made up the name, <laughs> should know, um, is a set of other um, Python applications that uh, feeds off of the linked open data. So it's the very end of the of the transform pipeline. So we are as close as possible uh, to the publishing, uh, to the uh, presentation format. And makes triple uh, F manifests as well as creating the triple um, F capable derivatives for the uh, images. Uh, we also have a fairly uh, complex varnish uh, implementation that uh, not only takes care of the caching management, uh, we have several levels of caching, but varnish does the, the most, uh, uh, is kind of a, uh, one of the most complex because it also takes care of vetting which images are open content and which are have to go through another set of authentication uh, steps. Um, we wanted that to be as, uh, efficient as possible. So varnish is a, is a great choice for that. And this is all together. So putting this all together, we have the data sources that feed the, the level one cache. Uh, that level one cache outputs JSON that uh, goes into the uh, LOD transformers that outputs JSON LD into the LOD gateway. And GCIS feeds off of that. And the, uh, the raw uh, images, the you know, large images from the data sources to make derivatives that are served via the GCIS uh, web gateway. Uh, in the middle of it, we have uh, the ID manager, uh, which I, uh, I'm gonna talk in a, uh, in a minute, or David will. Uh, so it's something that we use to uh, um, reconcile all the identifiers from different sources. Uh, it's a place where we put, uh, we create links between different identifiers of the same things that are represented in, in different systems. Uh, we not only have a, so a shared uh, um, software architecture, we also have some production workflows that we uh, that have been standardized um, uh, over time. So our partners, our colleagues that uh, manage the contents don't have to ask where do I put this image? How do I do this? Uh, there is already, uh, you know, there are workflows for us generating studio photography, for mass digitization, for uh, marketing images, uh, for example, when you create a marketing images, you put it, uh, so any image, you put it on uh, open text, which is one of our, our source systems. Uh, we have a custom uh, interface that, you know, you click on a, on a checkbox that says publish to, you know, for IIIF, and that triggers a series of events that are managed by the uh, task manager to uh, create the manifest and the uh, IIIF images. Uh, we also kind of uh, have a, a, an idea of where things go in terms of content modeling. Since we have very different uh, types of content, uh, we have to know what in each source systems uh, belongs in a canvas or in an image or in a range or in a manifest in a collection. So uh, we kind of laid out these uh, very uh, broad strokes uh, content models so we know that, you know, where, what, what goes where. And I'll hand it over back to you. <laughs> and so, you know, <clears throat> as you see, we put a lot of time and energy into building out that sort of infrastructure that you use to, to serve up AAAF images. And we're really doing this um, because it's such a core, you know, serving images and using images and the presentation of them is a core to almost everything we do at the organization. And it enables so many of the things that we want to do to provide public access. 
um, you know, one of them, I mean, the most obvious simple thing that we do is collect, you know, we use IIIF in the collections, we use IIIF in the archival views, we have deep zoom, we have multi-image, you know, sliders here, we've got the little thumbnails you click on to show it. This is that bread and butter of IIIF, what you enable using this sort of technology, and it's really important to do it. Um, it also, though, powers things like download. You know, we know we need to be able to download images, being able to say, oh, you'd like it in these three different formats, and you'd like to be able to get the manifest to use it in other viewers. Maybe you'd like to click directly into a comparison viewer, which is what we call Mirador because no one knows what that means. Um, <clears throat> that really gives us the, you know, all of this is AAAF. None of this requires really custom code on our part. This is directly supported by the AAAF infrastructure. And also, we also use annotations here. One of the things you'll see on our collection website is that we put different colored backgrounds behind different images here. And these are driven because we've gone through and annotated palettes onto each of our canvases. So we know which colors are in that manifest and it drives the background of those objects as part of that annotation process. Um, we also use it, if you look down here, we have a selection, uh, like a suggestion box for our objects. And one of the core suggestion criteria is color similarity. Um, and so the annotations on these images are driving that selection thing behind the scenes. You know, nothing says triple IF here, but because it's part of that infrastructure, the front end developer said, oh, we've got palettes. We can do things with this. And they didn't have to figure out beyond, oh, there's this data that I could use. Um, and also outside of the collections, um, every image on at least the new portions of our websites, the part that don't look like they're from 1995, um, is actually a triple IF image. So if you go to visit our website and there's a lovely picture of our campus, that's a IIIF image under the hood. Um, this lovely photo of the Spice Girls on our blog, this is a IIIF image. Um, and this really empowers things. We don't need deep zoom for these images. These aren't collection images. They aren't research appropriate, at least not for the sort of research we do. Um, <clears throat> But it allows us to do responsive images. So we have different sizes of these images for different screen resolutions. And those come directly out of the IIIF. Um, we also know that for many of these images, we end up having custom crops for those. Those crops are IIIF regions that are defined. And the, the IIIF image API provides those crops directly. Um, the social sharing images are IIIF images that are also derivatives. Um, and it also lets us use the caching infrastructure that Stefano built out to handle these different resolutions so that when the front end developers say, oh, it turns out I don't want a 16 by nine here anymore, I want a square image, it goes right into that caching infrastructure and doesn't, we don't need to recreate those derivatives just because the engineers changed their mind. Um, this is not how we use it for collections, but this is really important for building out robust serving and images out in that web environment as opposed to the collections environment. <clears throat> We're also using IIIF in our digital presentations. Um, I think the, the MAPS group talked about the work that they were doing in choir as part of the showcase today. It's a digital publication tool that we've put out. And you know, one of the key features that they want for these sort of scholarly publications is the ability to do deep zoom. Um, but we also really want it to be preservable and not have to have you know, dependencies on servers that will go down. These are scholarly publications. They have to last <clears throat> forever. I can't guarantee forever, but I can probably do better than two years. Um, <clears throat> And so what they do is they pull the images in and create a level zero triple IF um, server there, which is really just a set of images in folders, um, but that it allows us to actually use triple IF in there. And we're working on being able to import a triple IF manifest from a server, pull it in and then clone it as a level zero implementation so that we don't need that dependency, but still you have the power of triple IF in there. We've also discovered one of the things people want is the ability to provide some level of interactivity in these publications. And we've said content state is a really nice way to do that. You have your image, you say, oh, you wanna to zoom to this part of the image. You just put a link in there that's a content state link and you trigger that interaction on the publication. It gives us a standardized way that even if we have to upgrade these systems in the future, we know what that metadata is. It's not hidden in the code somewhere. It's a standardized content annotation. So these are ways we're using IIIF as a standard to really power interactivity, things outside of that traditional you know, book reading or museum object display. Um, we've also really found that the use of IIIF, the way we're using it makes it easier to work with vendors. Um, 
I've got a great digital team. We can't possibly build everything that the Getty wishes to build digitally, which means we end up working with you know partners. Some of them are in the room here. Um, being able to say, oh, you'd like images from our collection, go to the IIIF website and read the documentation. It's really clear about how this all works. If you have questions, come and ask us. And people rarely have questions because the documentation is good. And you have no idea what a headache that solves for me because I can't write documentation well and our team's not great at it. But being able to point someone to that documentation that says, go and use this. Um, <clears throat> we, you know, Our audio guide uses IIIF. They didn't have to ask us how to get images. Um, you're working on a digital publication for us at Digirati. You don't have to ask us how images work in our ecosystem. Um, Google Arts and Culture crawled our website and got our images off of it. They know how to use IIIF images at this point. It really, really helps to build out this ecosystem because the communication gets so much easier. And finally, it really lets us do what we call the weird stuff. <clears throat> we build lots of weird digital interfaces and they're really, really fast to prototype in this because we don't have to build out new image APIs. Um, the data ecosystem Stefano was talking about means you don't have to build out data APIs. We can think about interfaces, we can think about prototyping, we can try new things quickly. Some things work, some things don't, but having those shared standards underlying it let us really, really work quickly and build out interesting things that we try. Um, and where we're going next is we're beginning this collaborative project with colleagues at the Smithsonian. Uh, Getty and Smithsonian, several of the foundations came together to buy the archives of the Johnson Publishing Company, which is the publishing company that published the Ebony and Jet magazines. Um, it's a photo morgue of about 5 million photographs. Um, <clears throat> and we're doing it in partnership with Smithsonian, who has an amazing mass digitization program, has a really strong IIIF presence. And we're going to see whether or not we can actually build something where they have the images and we have the metadata and we use these shared standards to bridge between these two collections, be able to share the burden of building off a site this large across institutions using these shared standards. So I'm sure there will be new headaches that we discover in doing this, but this is really that interoperability that we've talked about. The ability to say, oh, we both understand the standard. This gives us a way to work together effectively without having to negotiate a major technical standard. And heaven knows the editors how long it's taken to get an agreement about how you would do this kind of work. We're going to build on top of that as opposed to try to duplicate. It also, we know this is a place we're going to use computer vision. We're going to use crowdsourcing. There's OCR here, really leveraging the annotation capability of this because we have 5 million images and we only know the handwritten label on the folder of that image. Um, it's going to have to require these sort of techniques and really leverage that annotation capability that we give to give us the metadata to make this content discoverable. So we're really excited about what you can do with this kind of technology and IIIF is going to be that core of the work we do. And so as we think about the work that we've done in IIIF, if we think about why we're doing this, it is again, IIIF is this enabling technology that lets us do the things we wanna do easily and more conveniently with shared communication and shared standards. Um, it really enables that kind of prototyping work that we want to do on this. Um, and it reduces the questions we have to ask of each other, uh, both for the people we're collaborating with and for ourselves. <clears throat> Stefano is a brilliant developer. He's one of a team. Um, if we had to negotiate how we, we serve images, how we cache things, how we order images every time we tried to build something, um, it, would, it would keep us from doing the work that actually matters. And leveraging the work of IIIF, leveraging the work of this community, building on things like the cookbooks gives us answers to questions that we know we have to answer without having to answer them ourselves. And so IIIF, IIIF is a cool piece of technology, but that the way in which it speeds the work outside of serving images and really the work of reaching the world with the images and content that we have is what makes it such an exciting technology for us. So, thank you very much. And Happy to take questions. Thank you. It's great to see the uh, architecture diagrams, but there really weren't enough blobs and more lines. 
<clears throat> but it was, it was good to see it in stages too. Is, do you expect that to grow more or integrate more or where is that going with the service growth? It will, it will almost certainly grow. We're trying hard to manage how quickly it grows because those things are both hard to keep up and maintain and also hard to um, convince everyone that they're essential. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, that's the, that's the inevitable way these things go. And uh, if I do follow on, um, and the uh, collaboration with the Smithsonian, I don't know if you can say more, um, their Morphosource and um, Smithsonian had have some collaboration too. It's just interesting to explore models where not every all the eggs are in one basket. So I don't know if you can say more about the split with metadata, et cetera. Um, it's really early stages. It re but if it if it continues to proceed the way that we both feel it will work, it really is. Um, they'll be responsible for working from the physical objects through digitization into the dams in the AAA ecosystem. And it will be inserting identifiers for every object they scan into our identity management system as a crosswalk to those images. And then we'll take those, those images and those identifiers and build out records in archive space and in our Arches sort of item level cataloging system to expand on the pixels. That way we don't have to think about the physical objects themselves. That's really the Smithsonian's to, to pixels. We do pixel, you know, we take those pixels and we add metadata to them and intellectual structure and it build a discovery environment on top of that. I may add something that um, I realized got kind of booted by, uh, from the presentation. Uh, you know, the ID manager is actually part of a future proofing strategy, uh, uh, you know, in order to keep things together. Also, another part is the um, uh, redirect service that we have, where as if you, you know, they, we will eventually sometime um, deprecate or uh, you move uh, resources, you know, the identifiers are not always uh, permanent. So we built this uh, redirect service where um, you can generate a redirect to either another resource or to a four ten, which is gone rather than not existing. There's a slight difference. So it, it is part of maintaining a, a long, uh, long living uh, architecture as this one. So you will be expanding your architecture diagrams maybe for my next year or so. I know it was 2.30 p.m., so I, I couldn't expect much. <laughs>I just want to uh, confirm something that I think I'm impressed by, but I want to make sure it's really <laughs> impressed by it. Uh, it, was, it goes all the way back to the first, one of the first couple slides, and maybe it's good for you. It looks like you had a whole service part that went and took JSON and then did LD processing. So does that do like expansion and compaction? And does it check on the vocabulary? And if it fails, does it tell the user? I'm just kind of curious, because you had a whole thing that's focused on the LD part. And you know, most of these projects, that's what people skate right over. It's not, we, we don't do the LD processing. I think a lot of what we do there is, we know we need a cache of the source systems. Um, we've taken down, I think every single production data repository that we have at some point. Um, I've gotten very good at apologizing to the content managers about that. <laughs> um, but that really represents the information and the model that the editors think about it or those systems think about it transforming it into the models that the presentation would think about or that that does is in our mind that transformation between just JSON that's dumped out of something like TMS into something like linked art. So it's, you know, yes, it adds context. Yes, it turns into RDF. Yes, it makes it available to go into the triple store. But the important thing is is going from the domain model of an information management resource to the information of a publishing resource. And so when we think about like the level ones are how we think about it behind the scenes, the level twos are how the world thinks about it as objects or people, not as, you know, constituents in TMS or, you know, archival resources. I, I wanted to follow up a little bit on that just because there is sort of this division when you, when you suddenly, when you decide that every sort of forward front facing uh, page on the website is going to be using these images and there's a cultural, there's a change that has to occur. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit 
uh, to that, to how that occurred, uh, the, maybe the time frame in which it occurred, and sort of some of the motivating, um, uh, some of the ways that perhaps you motivated the the um, your colleagues to adopt that. Part of the work there has been working in the systems that they work. So how we, you know, how do we how do we insert the ability to do the crops inside the content management system so people don't have to learn a triple annotation tool? How do we say in the dams there's a checkbox that says make this triple IF? And so as close as we can get to those existing workflows, the better, because infrastructure is easy, change management is hard. And changing the way that people work is the hardest part of everything we've done here. I mean, it took it took three years from the initial architecture diagrams to getting to the point where people actually use this. Some of that was building, a lot of that was figuring out how to communicate that effectively with the rest of the world. Um, and a lot of it was also focusing on not the cool technology that we talk about in this room, but saying, we know mobile is more part of our website. We need mobile crops. We're either going to have to make we already are currently making 25 derivatives for the different versions. To this, the next version of the website, we're going to have to add another 25 for that. Do you really want to do all of that, or do you want to learn, you know, how to create crop regions in IIIF? And so, by being able to leverage that, you know, this is the benefit that you will see in your workflows and in the public website. And we don't talk about IIIF to the content people very often because they don't care. Um, and they shouldn't have to care. That's not, it's not a technology for front end content editors. It's an enabling technology that lets them do their job more easily, as long as Stefano and the rest of the team can find ways to smooth that transition. I was curious if you were using um, features of the IIIF model apart from cropping and, and image sizing for the normal parts of the website that is not the digitized artworks. Um, it, currently we don't use manifests on the website. It's on that core website. It is the image service. And so we're using that set of technologies. I will say at one point we built out a zine version of our website for fun that uses the bitonal image feature of IIIF to make everything look badly photocopied. Um, <clears throat> I will also say we didn't uh, work very hard to make sure that didn't hit production. Um, but no, it really is mostly that image service and the work that it enables there. Um, we've talked about whether we should use manifests, but that gets back to the question that Tara was asking, training people to generate manifests for things like the slideshows on the presentation, or is it, at this point still too high a barrier to pull those in? I think when we start doing things that require complex presentation models, you know, we'll see if we can find ways to leverage more features of those. And we also know that, you know, as we roll out more and more of our video features, the the AAAF three video stuff, particularly around captioning, we're going to have to implement that in some way. It makes sense to do it via AAAF when we hit that point. Thank you. Um, yeah, speaking of triple F features, uh, we for for some uh, for a period we published some triple uh, F collections, which we had uh, sort of a mixed uh, experience with, especially with the support from uh, different viewers. So uh, currently, we are only uh, publishing manifests and you know structures within the manifest, like ranges and, and things like that. But I think that uh, collections could add another, you know, different layer of, uh, of semantic layer that we could use in, in other different ways. One more. Thanks. Um, so thinking back on the collaboration with the Smithsonian and the large number of images that are coming out of that, and also the comment around discoverability. And and maybe I uh, I don't know if I heard you correctly or not, but it seemed like you were alluding to potentially automated ways of uh, generating descriptive metadata. I didn't know if you could just sort of speak to those workflows or or uh, what your thinking is there. Um, the thinking is that that's essential because we can't possibly hire enough catalogers to do five million images, and so we're going to have to use either the community or robots. Um, 
How we do that is one of these things where we're looking for best practices from the field. It's a, we know we must do it. We don't really know how to do it. Um, and I think the other area that we're really, really sensitive there and thinking about is as we use these processes, how do we, how do we communicate the trustworthiness of them as part of the interfaces that we build out? I have full confidence that the robots will do is a good enough job to make it useful and discoverable, but it really is particularly for a, a collection of the sensitivity. Um, I think there's going to be an area that I'm going to be thinking about over the next three to five years. It's going to be about the user inter user experience around trustworthiness of data. Um, I, robots are good and computer science moves faster than we will ever move. Um, but that communicating trust is really the thing that I think is going to be most critical as we figure out how to use those technologies. All right. Thank you, Stefano. David? Thank you. All right. Um, you've heard his name invoked uh, in the 3D conversations, and he's uh, one of the founders of the Commons, but I'd like to welcome Ed Silverton to come talk about um, his exhibit project uh, and some of the uses there. Uh, okay, so I'm Ed Silverton from Nemesine, uh, based in Brighton in the UK. Um, I'm here to talk about the Exhibit project. Um, yeah. So Exhibit is a, it's a project that started in 2020. Uh, we were approached by um, the University of St. Andrews um, after, after the sort of start of the first lockdown because they the students were starting to work from home and they had a kind of beginnings of a dual delivery program where they wanted to kind of teach on campus but also remotely on online. And uh, they'd also been, had a large kind of 3D digitization project ongoing with their museum at the time. And uh, they'd heard that I knew a little bit about 3D. So I was going to talk with Ed. And uh, yeah, they, they the, the Esme Fairbairn uh, Collections Fund was giving them some money as well. So they, they, they were looking to uh, build a tool that enabled, it was kind of engaging for their students, but also for their faculty as well. Um, uh, and they wanted to use their sort of um, existing IIIF catalog um, and for, for people to kind of create stories with it using IIIF images and 3D models. So, uh, this is not, oh dear, the video is not working. <laughs> no, it's some um, PowerPoint. I thought press play. So, this is the um, online catalog. I don't know if you saw that, but there's an add to exhibit button. Uh, it's going to be use this record button. Do you want me to I can replay that? This is a bit, a bit quick. Um, yeah, use use this record. Uh, and this is like a nice object found in the collection. Uh, and then add to exhibit. They also have add to workspace if you want to do comparison and things like that. And then it, it jumps out to the exhibit.so tool uh, and it passes in the triple life manifest or collection. So you can pass in a collection and it will use every manifest in that collection. And then you, you put in your kind of uh, metadata, very basic metadata, uh, admittedly, uh, and click create. And then uh, that's the universal viewer on, on the right. Um, we used the universal viewer because it had kind of capability already to load images and triple life manifests and 3D models and all of that. And also, crucially, if, you, if you're loading up a, a book, you can page through it and find the page that you want. So this is the kind of basic user experience. You, you've got a kind of a list on the left, and then uh, you can create, you can zoom and describe to kind of talk about different aspects of the image or 3D model, and then you get a kind of slide presentation. But there are there are other types of 
presentations now um, that you can make with it. Um, so, yeah, quizzes. We recently added this. This is a high, kind of highly requested feature um, from various sources, actually. Shortly after we launched uh, the project, we started getting requests. So you can see at the top there was a, there was a tab button list, so you can switch to quiz. And this is a non-destructive action. So you can change between templates as much as you like, and you don't, you're not going to lose any data. So I'm kind of uh, creating a kind of, you can see question and pinpoints. The tabs in the boxes change depending on what type of template it is. So I've, I've asked the question there, and I can type in answers uh, and as many as I like. And um, you can mark which one's the correct answer in the, with the checkbox. Uh, there can be multiple correct answers, or you know, um, and you can reorder them uh, as well, and edit them obviously later if you need to. Um, so I'm marking that one as correct, and I go to pinpoints, uh, and you have a kind of a collection of pinpoints. These are annotations with a pinpointing annotation uh, motivation, and then you can just double click on the image to create a pinpoint, and it's exactly the same with 3D models. They look identical, and then you can reorder things as well just by just drag and drop. And you can you can intermingle questions with regular slides as well. Um, you don't they don't all have to be questions. Um, so if I click next, I get a kind of an incorrect. Please try again, and you know, so you pick the right answer, and it lets you proceed. Um, you can also um, click on the pinpoints um, to select which as well. It works both both ways. Um, so another feature we added, which has proved to be very useful, is duplication. So you can see the duplicate uh, in, oh, I need to press play again. <laughs> I definitely <laughs> made these automatic. Uh, so you click on duplicate, and that has the same effect as add to exhibit. It's just the same thing. It's kind of running through the same process. Uh, so you can create a copy of it. Um, and th this is quite powerful because the, the lecturers at um, St. Andrews, they, they can kind of pre-populate an exhibit with all the, uh, all the stuff easily from their catalog and then hand it off to their students and then they can remix it and reuse it. The students it kind of take some of the effort off them to kind of go and find it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a useful feature. Um, uh, another one is password protection. This is kind of recently added. Uh, it's a bit like Vimeo. So it's, it's exactly like Vimeo. You, 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 type, you type in a password. Um, and then if I then click preview and I then I open this in an incognito tab, uh, type in a password and then hit enter and then you've got access to it. Um, so yeah. Odd thing on these slides, and then finally for the, for the kind of education slash blended learning section of the presentation, that, that just to show you that there's a, you know there's also a storytelling kind of scrolly telling template, um, and uh, here's a here's a scan of a gorilla skull from the collection, and uh, it's kind of mixed with images and things like that. So you can kind of just sort of tell a story. You can you can zoom in exactly as you would with an image. On a piece of the, on part of the 3D model that, you, that you're interested in, and this is what I mentioned earlier. I had to basically invent my own annotation standard to to, to save in the database. Um, so yeah, I'm eager to come up with you know to to work on that with everyone and you know come up with a, with a something everyone can agree on. Um, yeah. So the next section is uh, so that's the kind of teaching and blended learning bit. Um, you can also just do straight up kind of online engagement um, sort of stuff with it. Um, so uh, this is an example of uh, uh, Royal Pavilion Museums in, in Brighton. Uh, they, they run they run all of the museums in the city of Brighton and Hove, and they've really taken to exhibit. They absolutely love it, and uh, they've been rolling it out on their on their site. And um, this is it on their site. They've, they they did a project recently. Um, to digitize some Chinese wallpaper um, in the pavilion. And uh, they're, they're using it to kind of embed 
it digs a bit as you would the universal viewer it's exactly the same principles uh in the blog and then you can kind of tell a story and that works with all the templates that could be a scrolly telling one it could be a quiz um or the other one i'll get to uh so yeah that's that's kind of embedding and this goes on and on and on it's actually really interesting this one I, so much going on in these images um so yeah campaigns um oh, oh dear missing bits i should have tested these slides that was on this computer how odd uh yeah Damn. <laughs> So, yeah, what am I going to do, <laughs> Glenn? Sorry. Yeah, maybe. Um, so, I'll just a bit more. Yeah, that's the real shame because this is the this is the good bit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, anyway. Yeah, it's it's all on um, OneDrive, so I have to do it in PowerPoint, but idea. I think I'm I'm stuck there. Yeah, there were videos. Do we run the PowerPoint directly? Uh, it's the same, it's the same one, yeah. yeah. I mean, did you show that in Google? Did you go Well, suffice to say, I'll just do a live demo. Yeah. Right. Um, Oh, because it's it's uh, it's on the it's on a sort of staging server. But basically, you, you can add you can add YouTube um, videos now. So Bruges um, library, public library, requested that, and uh, you can do you can do uh, kiosk uh, presentations. So you can you can press play, and it will it'll run through on a timer. You can set the time for for every slide, uh, and um it's really cool because they've they've got it set up in their museum in situ on screens i wish i could show you sorry <laughs> um yeah uh anyway that's it i guess <laughs> oh yeah well there, there's there, there's um there's a workshop coming up um where i can if you want to learn more about this i can show you probably yeah, I haven't got it. Yeah, uh, I, I, I trusted that PowerPoint would. Yeah. It's a bit of a palaver, isn't it? Yeah. So, oh, ah, and the other, the other big part of the, so, um, everything's built on Google on the Google Cloud sort of stack. These are Firebase. And um, that's you know proven to be really really useful, really nice to develop for. And if you have a Google account, you can just it's pretty easy to just set up a Firebase project, and I can deploy it for you. I can set it up, and you've got your own instance, and um, you can just you, you then have, because you've got your own instance, you've got all your own analytics, and basically everything that goes on. In uh, when people are using Exhibit, it's it's tracked. Every event is tracked, and you can see with quite fine granularity exactly what how people are using it, which is a big deal for St Andrews. That was, they needed to demonstrate that it was you know the money was spent well, if you like. Um, as as with Royal Pavilion as well, it's a similar kind of thing. You know. um, and yeah, also um, the the Exhibit show up in Google search results well as well. So um, it's, it's very, it's got all the Google juice. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, uh, any questions? <laughs> uh, 
It's just a clarification. Uh, the self-hosting, it's it's still based on Google. And so yeah. So if you've if you've got a Firebase account, you can add me as a user to it and I can get, log in and set everything up for you. Um yeah. Done it, I did it recently for the Bruges public library and uh, you can you can also kind of um you can turn features on and off as well. So the, the YouTube feature is it's actually behind it in a config, so you can kind of turn that on and off if you, if you don't necessarily want that. Um, and you can also um, override all, all the text and styles and everything like that. We, um, we did a project for the um, Brighton Festival where we, we changed all the fonts and everything um, uh, to make it fit. So when, 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 the, when the exhibits were embedded in their site, it looks just like part of the rest of the site, basically. Okay, great, thanks. Hi, Ed. So you skated right through it, but pinpointing motivation. Yeah. I liked that one. Where did you, did you, I, I double checked on the web annotation. That's not one they list. Did you make that one? Like, did you extend motivations with that motivation? Yeah. Nice. I've also like extended it with framing. Um, so what, what, when you position the camera around the 3D model, there's nothing that really fit with that. Um, so I thought, you know, framing makes sense. You kind of, yeah, but I'm change that down on, you know, later on when we arrive at something standard. Other questions? Oh. Oh, what um, is the workshop that you had mentioned? I think you might have an old slide deck here. So. It, it was it was on the it was on here. Um, it's, I think it's the twenty ninth. Uh, if you go to tripleif.io slash events, um, I just don't want to tell you the wrong date. There are four workshops that week, and it's one of the four. I think I know what's happened. I think it's OneDrive. I think OneDrive hadn't synced or something. That'll, yeah. Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe it's a price opportunity. I can, I can give you I can give you a demo uh, and that's is where it really goes off but uh, yeah so um, let's try and like find a YouTube video uh, um, I was using uh, yeah <laughs> Check out this verbo. Oh, no. Look at me. Here I am. The YouTube video. And um, British Library have their own um, YouTube channel that they're, that they're using. So, yeah, that's, that's now added to the exhibit. And this is the UV on the right. And the UV, UV4 has just been released. And um, it has this whole new concept of um, uh, content handlers. Um, so quite excited about, about this. It's, it's kind of blown the doors off uh, in terms of like what, what we can do with, with, the, with the project. So, you know, this, this tab down here, uh, Triple Life is now one type of content that the UV can load. So, you know, if I click on YouTube there, it's, it's gonna load that up, but, you know, We've had more tabs, different types of viewers. You know, this is this is really important for the UV project, I think, because we get a lot of complaints, I guess, about like uh, why do I have to put my PDF in the Triple manifest? And if if we can, you know, get a dedicated PDF extension, that's that's what people want. So that kind of corporate use case that keeps coming up. Um, so yeah, so I can then um, uh, you know, put add, add a comment in here, uh, and I can select the sort of duration, like you know, part of the video that I'm interested in. It tells me, you know, I can adjust it a bit. Let's click OK. And then fingers crossed. Uh, 
you know, sort of hit, hit play. Sort of anyway. Maybe skin to skin contact where the hands connect. <laughs> a sense of the spread or closeness of the fingers and thumbs. Oh, to get something random. <laughs> so, uh, they, they, um, so yeah, that's what they've got running on on, on their kiosk machines at at the, at the museum, and it, and it loops. It will just loop forever and ever. And, uh, yeah. Might be two D models or images or videos or whatever. Yeah. Um, is there a way in Exhibit to export out the JSON or whatever that might be driving this? Like, big, that was a request. Import and export of annotations that keeps coming up, and definitely want to do that. Yeah. And how triple IFE is that? <laughs> uh, so another thing. <laughs> Another thing we've we've done is um, where is it? Uh, you can share um, is this JSON option, so you can kind of access the kind of JSON that the, the tool uses. But uh, the UV is, is there's, there's a little bit of kind of magic going on. Uh, it's not it's not sort of standard standardized. It's been stored in the database in a sort of standardized format. Like the the YouTube um, annotations are just using the same the, the you know, time selector, but um, the UV at the moment is has quite sort of um, initial support for uh, for annotation, so um, it's, you know it's a really stripped down version of it. So, but there's nothing to stop us you know, exporting that JSON in. Any, you know, the data is all there. You can export it in any format you like, essentially. But yeah, right now it's need a bit more. Another project's come along, like where you know to do the import and export feature, and then then it will be standardised. Um, I I have uh, to come out. I'm a big fan of the uh, exhibit, and um, <laughs> I pass it on to several uh, friends and in workshops. And um, recently, a friend of mine said, "Oh, this is brilliant, but you know, it would be so great if we just could put this." Um, Presentation this this slide view on our um, on our block system. Then I went to the share function, and eventually uh, the embed function was there. And this was really just uh, so it matched exactly the expectation, or it even overcame the expectation. I wanted to ask you something about the usage since you track the um, the audience, uh, or you might have um, an idea. Uh, how does how how widely is it adopted uh, within some institutions? Um, I, I think the last time I looked at it, there's like seven thousand users or, or something like that on, on exhibit.so. But um, in uh, Bruges Library, are the first people to uh, set up their own instance. But St Andrews wants their own instance as well, and they're going to actually. So that's. That's an important point, I think. But um, the, the back end is uh, Firebase. So it's the Firestore that is real time database. So um, when, when you're editing all this stuff on the left and you're just dragging these around, that's actually kind of like real time. The database is so, the database is so fast. Um, and so all, all, all the back end is hosted on the Google Cloud stuff, but the front end is actually hosted on the cell, um, which um, is this um, the whole the whole project is built with uh, Next.js, which is built which is by the cell, and they've got a really nice kind of deployment platform. And uh, but because the front end is decoupled from the back end like that, it means you can kind of put the front end wherever you want to put it. So St Andrews, they they want to put it on their own. They want to run Next.js on their own servers, so they're working on that at the moment. So. And do you have an idea about um, the ratio of uh, viewers and people who actually edit their own exhibit? Uh, I don't. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it, you, you make it really easy for people to, to see, uh, oh, well, that's brilliant. I would like to duplicate it or just create my own. And uh, I think uh, the gap between consumer and producer is quite small. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of a yeah, tight kind of feedback loop. 
going on there. You know, and it's, it's, the whole thing is designed to help you make this as easy as possible for people to use. And uh, I've got to credit my partner Sophie for all of the kind of amazing ideas she had around the UX and things like that to make it like that. Because I'm, I'm a developer, not so much kind of a UX person, and uh, I have a great debt <laughs> for that. Um, yeah. So you've mentioned a couple things that are sort of in the works or that you know are coming down the pipe, um, and I'm just wondering right now what your prioritization is for all those sort of moving pieces yeah. in terms of what to implement next. So one thing I've got to do soon is um, raw, raw pavilion. I've been testing it with teachers uh, in Brighton and because they're, they're, they're interested in having um, teachers use their collections and create lessons around it. And they, they've had them using it and collecting feedback from them. And uh, they've put that in a bullet, you know, itemized list for us to go through. And uh, one of the one of the, kind of the big things is like they want user accounts, yeah. So so right now the way the way it works is uh, it's kind of like a Google Doc where you share a link to edit um, an edit URL or a view URL. Um, uh, and the the edit URL means it's just like a Google Doc. You know, everyone, anyone with that URL can edit it. And that that's that is actually that was actually a feature for St Andrews. It's not because we didn't. Want to make a login conventional login system is because that's what they requested because um, their use cases, uh, their anything their students use, they're basically responsible for, and uh, the GDPR and all of that. It's a whole minefield, so um, they, they 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 just this this worked for them. Um, other people like you know it was Royal Holloway University. We did a project for them where yeah login's fine no problem. So it, it, it depends on the or institution, what the policy is, but yeah, there's nothing to stop us adding conventional user accounts to this as well. Um, so that's that's one of the big features they've asked for. But there's a there's a whole there's a whole like laundry list of kind of UX tweaks. Like this needs to be more opaque. Uh, can we change the font? Uh, that, that. Maybe one last question here. So, so is most of this experience served statically then? It's all like on Netlify? Is there much going on server yeah. side? So Netlify and Vassal are kind of equivalent platforms really uh, in many ways. It's just, it's, it tracks the GitHub repository and whenever there's a, a deploy to it, it uh, whenever, whenever there's an update to GitHub repository, it deploys it to Vassal, yeah. And you can have your own custom domain if you like. Uh, what, the way, the way so uh monk the the cell dot app. That's the that's where Bruges have got their own, you know, got their own Vercel account and I've kind of deployed to that. And then but you don't get the you know, it's just kind of a simplified version of the site and you just have a create exhibit button there instead. Um but you know you that that's quite a convenient way way to do it. Um but you could equally just create a register a domain and point that at it as well. All right, thanks, Ed. All right, uh, we are now ready for our tea and coffee break. It's uh, set up right outside and uh, we'll reconvene at 4 p.m. Rocky, I'm going to send you the uh, a minute or two just to file them. Give you folks just a minute or two to. Okay. Yeah. 
All right, uh, why don't we get started, get settled. All folks are uh, coming in for the last minute here, but uh, we're in our last section uh, before we head out to reception out on the quad. Um, so for the first presentation is break. I'm happy to introduce uh, Ron Snyder talking about using AAAF images and visual assets. You're all set, right? Yeah, I'm all set. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so we're around in the turn and entering the home stretch for the sessions today. Um, so um, some of what I'm going to talk about will look familiar because uh, this idea of, of using AAAF images for digital storytelling has been touched on a few times uh, earlier today. And hopefully I have a, you know, a little bit of a, an angle or twist on this that, uh, that, that will be useful. And, Uh, so, so first, um, first, let me introduce who I am, and, um, and then we'll we'll jump into the, the guts of the presentation. So I'm um, I'm Ron Snyder. I'm I'm with the JSTOR Labs team. JSTOR is part of the Ithaca uh, family of organizations, uh, non -for profits that provide academic resources to um, to higher education institutions primarily. But we are we're doing more than that uh, uh, these days. But that's our primary mission. Um, labs has been around for going on eight years now. And then we do a number of things. Our, our two biggest projects currently are providing uh, JSTOR content in, uh, in uh, access and prison programs, providing uh, general content inside of um, uh, prison education programs and also a text and data mining platform. Those are our, our two uh, flagship uh, projects right now. But Juncture, which I'll talk about today is something where we've used a lot of triple IF, a lot of linked open data, uh, some geospatial mapping uh, tools um, and try to merge all those together in a hopefully uh, an in, engaging and an interesting application of uh, digital storytelling. Um, so I'm, I'm going to jump into or I'm going to talk about the the process that led to the creation of this juncture tool set. Uh, reflect on what we've built and some lessons learned, and then maybe look ahead at, at some changes and some things we would do in the next version. Uh, as these things typically go, you, you learn things as, as you're going, and, and uh, as much as we can, we try to take advantage of that and, and use it going forward. So the origins of Juncture uh, go back to one of the earliest labs project, and this was a project we called the Livingston's uh, Zambezi Expedition. So in addition to tons of journal articles, uh, JSTOR also has a JSTOR plants or global plants uh, uh, organization or site that has something north of uh, two and a half million type specimens. And um, thinking about how we might do something interesting with those type specimens, uh, the Livingston Expedition Project came out of that. A number of the type specimens uh, that we have were collected by Livingston and his, uh, his botanist, uh, John Kirk, I think his name was um, in around 1850 in a couple of expeditions that, that took place in, in Africa. So the, uh, the, the, the project is now defunct. We have, there's, some, uh, there's a video and, and some screenshots on our site if you're interested in, in, in that project. But the basic idea was that we had a current day maps. We use uh, leaflet and, and all the infrastructure that goes with leaflet. We had a couple of the digitized maps that, that were created on the expedition. So the maps from the expedition were digitized and used as historical map overlays on the current day map. And then we put pins on the map to represent the time and place where the plant specimens were collected. Then you get to click on the specimen and bring up the, the high-res uh, viewer for the, for the nice uh, type specimen image. Um, and there were some other things we did. Uh, there were a lot of correspondence, a lot of correspondence between uh, the expedition and uh, and um, 
and, and the NERC collaborators, and so we've got images of, of the letters and other things that, that occurred. But the, the biggest thing was the, the type specimens and trying to put those in a time and, and place uh, on, on the map. Very interesting uh, project, and I'd always wanted to take another run at that and do something more elaborate and then take into account you know, more, more types of tools. And we had an opportunity in 2018 with this thing uh, that's referred to as, as the Plant Manager Initiative. So this is like a DH idea, but with a botany overlay on it. Uh, so that that uh, that was sort of the start of the of the juncture tool that I'll, I'll demonstrate, and then sort of in parallel with that, a researcher or, or professor from uh, from Kent in the UK contacted me about this idea of wanting to put together a site, uh, basically a, a collection of visual essays uh, related to uh, Dickens and other other uh, um, uh, authors and and, and notable. Uh, people from from the Kent area, and that he kind of evolved into a much broader treatment of the um, of, of the Kent Maps project. So I'll, I'll show that too. So, so both of those things led into our idea or our plan to open source Juncture, which we did at the end of last year, and and um, and that's what I'll uh, demonstrate. So the Zambezi project I mentioned, this was where we started with the idea of this digital storytelling. The Plant Humanities Project, this was a Mellon funded project, ran three years. And the initial idea of this project was pretty much a mapping project. It was a continuation of that Zambezi project that I mentioned. And um, as we started developing this and, and doing some user testing, uh, we quickly found out that we needed to do something more with images. We certainly had these high resolution uh, plant specimens that we needed to show in an engaging and interactive way, and, you know, definitely a deep zoom sort of um, tool was needed and we use a non-triple IF deep zoom viewer initially, but as other types of images were brought in to the visual essays, uh, we had to kind of rethink that. And that, that I think was the first time that triple IF uh, appeared on my radar. And looking back on it, I wish we would learn more about it and, and jumped into that in a more thoughtful and, and planned way. It was sort of an incremental thing. We, we started adding features and then doing this and that. and what we ended up with, well, it works and works pretty well. It's kind of a Frankenstein sort of implementation. And, and to do this over again, I would, uh, would definitely uh, approach that differently. But um, but that said, the, the triple IF idea and capabilities provided through the existing tools were you know, just a real eye opener and, and opened up a lot of doors on, on these visual essays. So I'm gonna, I've got, Slide chart. I had these as a backup in case the demo didn't work. Uh, so I'm not going to go through the static version, but I'm going to try to jump through the site and go through one or two of the visual essays to kind of show the idea here that, that we have. So I don't hit the escape key. Um, so this plant humanity site currently has, I think, somewhere around 18 to 20 of these these visual essays, and each of the essays has a card on the front page with a nice image and a link to the to the essay. And these were created by uh, some postdoc fellows that Dunbar and Oaks uh, had on staff, and they've had a number of these uh, these groups come through over the three years, and they have uh, authored many of these. Some of these are actually authored by by guest authors, uh, very prominent uh, people in the. Um, the field of botany, but I'll pick one of the ones that was recently created by one of the fellows. Uh, this might be the most recent one on maize. Um, so the idea of the visual essay is that we have, the, the text is, is the, the, the key element. So, so the, the essay visualizations, the Triple IF images, the maps, and other types of visualizations are, are there to provide context and depth, but the, the essay is really the, the, the key here. And, and these aren't quite peer-reviewed sort of articles, but but they're scholarly in nature, uh, but trying to reach a broader audience. And, and then there are proper footnotes and attributions and that sort of thing. So these were written in a very thoughtful sort of way. Um, but as you scroll through the text on the left side, the visualizers uh, will change on, on the right, depending on what the author wanted to accentuate in, in this particular section. So this is a, a viewer that has three triple IF images. Um, 
these aren't particularly in, engaging in terms of interact, inter interaction. Some of them do have the ability to zoom in and kind of using annotations, do a stories or exhibit IO sort of, you know, story within a story sort of thing using the, the, the triple IF um, images. This is one where they're trying to compare these two images in some way. I'm not exactly sure what she's trying to contrast here, but but we do have a a couple ways of doing this image comparison. We have the side by side mode as we see here, and there's also a stack mode where you can put an image on top of another and then reveal or hide the one on top, depending on how you want to you know, use your slider to kind of put that back and forth. Um, other thing I'll mention here, I, I did. I meant to um, show this in one of the earlier paragraphs, but one of the things that we also do is incorporate linked open data. So you'll notice here we have a, a, a hover that brings up some information about this particular location or I guess an organization or a company in this case, but it could be a place or a person. And this data is pulled dynamically from Wikidata. So there is a QID associated with this paragraph and the tool will go through and look for references to that entity that is associated with that QID. So, so there's some matching of, of text and it's kind of a fuzzy matching. So it, it doesn't have to be an exact match, but using the QID, it can go out and grab the aliases and other texts from the entity and, and do this, this dynamic matching of the um, info box. Um, here's a case where we've linked an interaction with the image. So clicking on one of these items will cause the image to zoom in on a particular region. Um, uh, here's another one. So this, this is a case where we're using a, both a GeoJSON overlay and a, a marker pin to show a particular location on, on this map. So more of the same, you scroll down and each of the, the paragraphs will become active and then uh, one or more viewers. In some cases, there'll be more than one viewer associated either the time frame just to kind of show what that looks like. Um, here's another viewer. Uh, so that this is uh, bringing in a third a third party uh, viewer. This is a night lab timeline viewer. So the, the the author has created this and linked this to the to the essay. Here here's one of the the nice plant specimens from JSTOR Global Plants. Again, there are three in this case. And these are run through a open C drag and triple IF viewer. Uh, this, I think there's one of these viewers. That, well, this, this is the video, so we can bring in video. Um, right, so there are any number of viewers. Far and away, the triple IF images are, are the ones that are more, most commonly used. And as we look forward at a next generation of Junker, I want to really lean into to that idea of using triple IF as a as a, a key element in a, a visual essay. So that's the uh, another another one. A bunch of GeoJSON overlays. So we use this um, who's on first link from again using uh, Wikidata. So the uh, the author will identify the entities that they want to use in a map, and then we'll pull the the who's on first GeoJSON overlay uh, using Wikidata from uh, from the who's on first site. So while there's a lot of interesting things going on in the background, the authors don't have to worry about that too much. They, they need to basically do a couple of things. They need to uh, identify the, the entities or the QIDs that are whatever the essay is about. So identify the aboutness of the essay with those QIDs and find some images uh, that they, they can use or want to use. You know, those are the primary things that they need to do. Uh, real quick, quickly, I uh, jump to this Kent map site. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this since I'm sort of running into a time issue here. But same idea, there are a number of essays. In this case, they have a, um, uh, I think they've got probably 300 of these. So they have, they have these, these categories that, that you can drill down into that, that provide these kind of themed essays. But it's the um, same idea. In this case, we have a, a map. This one, used to have a nice historic map overlay on it. Um, I forget who it was, somebody mentioned Map Warper and, and the fact that that project's now defunct and you know, the, the sites that were supporting that are, you know, that's a 
it's a get what you pay for you know, kind of deal. It, it's a free site. We were using it, it worked nice, um, but um, for some reason my historic map overlays aren't, aren't showing on, on this. But it provides a nice way to kind of zoom in. And this also, in addition to zooming in on, on triple IF regions, we can also use the same sort of interaction to click on something in the, in the text and zoom to a map region and, and do some interesting things with, with the maps as well. Okay, so let me jump back to the um, to the PowerPoint or the Google Slides. Um, Talked about that. That this was a, um, a collaboration with this professor of Victorian studies that led to the, the Kent map. So the, the idea was that they wanted to create these sort of standalone uh, essays, but tie them together in a, in a website that you know, could be searched from Google and, and accessed and, and such. So the, um, the the juncture framework provided a nice way of doing that. Uh, provides a way to. Um, I'll, I'll get into the the architecture of juncture maybe. Right after this one. So this this is sort of the idea that this is what the author sees. The author sees markdown files and, and those markdown files are stored in GitHub. So the whole idea is that there's a markdown file with some custom markup that you find the viewers to be created. The author creates those and then under the covers, uh, the framework will do a number of things. They'll use triple IF certainly, uh, leaflet uh, brings in a lot of images from various sources, uh, Wikimedia Commons being probably the, the, the most common one, uh, some D3 visualizations. Um, so it does all that sort of transparently uh, to the um, to the author. They don't, they don't need to worry about that. So this, this is what a visual essay looks like. Oh, there we go. Um, so Markdown, I, you know, it's become sort of ubiquitous you know, these days. You know, most people uh, that are tech savvy have encountered Markdown in one way or another. And even if they have learning Markdown, it doesn't take more than 10, 15 minutes to learn the basics. Um, so it, Markdown was our choice for the, the markup language to use for the visual essays. We start with Markdown, uh, a user can format the text, use a Markdown to the degree that they need and then add any number of, um, of tags uh, that are tied to particular paragraphs. So the way a, a, a tag is associated with the paragraph is that it basically is uh, contiguous in, in the text with, with the paragraph. So this, this example, this, this is sort of a visual essay, hello world sort of example here. This is a very basic thing, but it shows the, the key elements. So the key elements are uh, this is not required, this is optional, but this is typically what a user will want to do is add a one or more QIDs that express the aboutness of, of the essay, to de define what the essay is talking about. And that can be leveraged in a few different ways. Uh, of course, the markdown text. And then in this case, we have two images. One is an image that does not have a triple IF manifest natively. So what the tools in essence doing is dynamically creating a manifest using a few attributes that are attached to the to the tag. So in this case, we have a label and a license and an attribution statement that will be pushed into a manifest and then displayed in the viewer. Uh, the second image does have a uh, is something that exposes a triple IF manifest. So this comes from from Harvard and and they um, of course have provided uh, any number of triple IF. Um, images. So we have two images here. Then this last one is a, a map. And the map um, takes a few attributes. The main ones are the center point and, and the zoom level. And what the, what the map does is it creates the map and then it looks for references in the text and then creates pins or in some cases geojson overlays on the map. And the way it does that is it looks at these QIDs and then scans the text and finds references to the text that uh, correspond to those QIDs. Let me, uh, maybe this is time for another quick demo. I'll show you what that, oh, I think I made a mistake here. I pushed the escape button. Um, um, what was my recovery action here? Right click? 
Yeah, yeah maybe. I don't want to send us down some rabbit hole we can't get out. There you go. Okay, thank you. I, I was afraid my muscle memory would just push the escape button. Okay, so um, I'm going to go to a GitHub repository that I set up with a couple of real quick demos. Um, so I mentioned that Visual Essay is nothing more than a markdown file. Right now, uh, we only support GitHub. I, I think in a future version, we want to be able to support you know, other places to host these markdown files. But GitHub is, is convenient for a lot of reasons. You have the, the version control and then all the things that go with GitHub and GitHub pages. If you want to assign your own custom domain to your to your uh, repository, then you basically got a website for visual essays that, that, that you know, can't just do something other than you know, our, our SOC um, uh, domain. So the, um, the one I just showed that, um, Click on this, there we go. Now we're taking that markdown file and turning it into a visual essay. This is that hello world essay. Um, so I mentioned the tool will take the QID and then do this dynamic linking. So if I go down to the second paragraph, you'll notice that we have a marker on this, this map and marker is associated with this term, which is associated with whatever the QID is for, for a multi. And there's also another one for, you know, for, for this other QID we have here. So we get these, Nice info boxes. We get the geo coordinates that are put on the map. Um, again, we have the ability to do this. Um, we got the info box, and then we can um, you know, do this zoom in interaction too, if we want to you know, kind of zoom in on particular things. So the markup isn't too horrible. I mean, you got those those tags, but one thing I, I have um, uh, looking back and, and thinking about. What I would do differently if um, if I had a chance to do this over again, I would let me go back to the PowerPoint. This is the current markup. So what I would like to do is simplify this markup. There's no really no reason to have fully formed correct HTML tags. Yeah, we need to. Users that aren't familiar with this invariably will forget to put a closing quote or an angle bracket or you know what have you. So, and and the right now the tool doesn't do a very good job of reporting errors. So that's that's a source of frustration that that users, um, I, I you know I take personal responsibility for that because you know that was sort of my choice to require fully formed HTML. But there's no reason to do that. So the next version will have a much simplified tagging mechanism that don't that does not require that. I'll give you a quick example of what that looks like, and I'll jump back. Um, so here's, uh, there we go. This is the simplified version. Same essay. It's going to more or less do the same thing. There are a couple other differences, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a second. But th this is the simplified version. So we've got uh, the header, which I didn't talk about, but that puts that that banner header, and you can also put some navigation links and that sort of thing in there. And the simplified uh, tag, and also the simplified uh, uh, manifest reference. This is another thing that might be of interest to some folks in this room. So, I'll, in in this next generation prototype that I'll, I'll demo, maybe not uh, running out of time, but but um, it provides the ability to self-host IIIF images in GitHub, and then you can use some conventions to identify the label and things like the the. the the, the licensing information and such so you can create a um, a triple IF image from GitHub and that's what's going on here. I've got a personal GitHub account from uh, that that I put a, an image in and that that will be used for uh, for this second version of the essay or the uh, demonstration. Maybe I'll just do that real quick. Just do the same thing. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go back here. So this one is this 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 sort of prototype of second generation simplified syntax. Um, I'm using this this GitHub you know, sort of hosted image. And this new version has a lot nicer way of showing licensing and attribution information. I've got this side panel that, that you can bring up and it provides some basic information. You can associate a, a QID for what this item is depicting, which is very useful for discovery. 
I haven't done this yet, but my plan is to take all this and be able to do um, it provide some search for some searching for images about a particular location based on these uh, these these, these pics URDs. Um, same business with the you know, zoom tool. You can do that pretty easily too. All right, so I'm going to try to wrap this up. Um, so I, I'm around all day tomorrow and this afternoon. My colleague Julia. Um, who is my partner in crime here. We'll, we'll, we'll be around if there are questions, we'll talk about this more, happy, happy to do that. Um, so, I wanna talk about, so the architecture, I think we talked about that. Um, I know it's real flash up the, the obligatory uh, chart real quick, okay. So, I, th I think we've validated the utility of providing Markdown as a way to create these nice interactive essays and, and create websites and based on putting a bunch of these together. I, I think that that idea has a lot of traction. Uh, what needs improved are the authoring tools. Right now, there, there are no authoring tools. You go into your GitHub editor and you create your Markdown and you deal with you know, debugging problems and such. What I want to do in the next version is have an interactive editor that provides preview capabilities and, and better error reporting and, and all that sort of thing. Search engine optimization is not great. Everything is done client side and and, and that's tough for Google when you're dynamically loading your content. And, and so that, that's a problem. So we need to do something that does more server side rendering. I'd like to really take better advantage of IIIF. I think we're, we're doing a decent job, but like to do better. Um, accessibility is not great. Uh, that that two pane viewer approach doesn't translate great to mobile phones. We need to think more about how we're going to provide an easier flow back and forth between desktop and mobile. And so there are, there are a number of things we need to do. Uh, what I would like to do is, you know, kind of this laundry list of things on this next page. Um, some of which has already been done. Um, as a matter of fact, I think maybe as a as a last thing in my last three minutes or whatever, um, probably too late to do the correct thing now. It's a full screen. Um, I have a real quick. Um, oh, here we go. So I have the, this this editor um, that sort of gets at this idea of this web based authoring environment, with previewing and, and drag and drop. So if you find a tripwire image you want to use, you can drag the manifest URL in, into the box and it will create the, the tag. Uh, for many sites uh, that don't provide IIIF images um, explicitly, if they provide an API, and many do, I'm you know, you're talking about Wikimedia Commons, Flickr, um, JSTOR, Community Collections. They don't provide IIIF, but they provide the image and they provide an API. So I can build a IIIF manifest. So when you drag and drop it, it kind of goes and grabs the API data and creates the manifest and such. And um, um, maybe in my last 30 seconds, I'll show you what that looks like. So I got a, a demo essay here. Um, here's a Wikimedia Commons page. Um, let me just grab some image at random here. Grab this one, I drag this over. Well, actually, it's gonna create a header since I don't have a header yet. Um, let me go ahead and drag it over and I'll drag another one. Um, so it creates this uh, this tag and then the reference to the image. And then when I push the preview behind the scenes, it's creating the manifest and, and putting the, the viewer in, in the preview. Um, so I hold my breath at this point because I haven't actually tried these images. So this one worked. Um, this other one might, might take a bit longer. There we go. So it pops into place. And we've got the other thing that this improvement over the first gen is that when we put an image in the header, we also have a way to attribute that. So I can click on this and you get the licensing and attribution information. Before we didn't do that. It wasn't, wasn't very responsible image use where I think we're, we're doing better. Um, and same thing here, you get all the bells and whistles. You can also annotate this from there. You can go here and you can create your annotations and, and then they, they show up. Let me do that real quick. Um, I apologize if we're running out of time. I'm just gonna do it real quick. Well, I won't correct my spelling here, but let me create that. So we've got an annotation on this image. If I go back and if I refresh this guy, it should show up. 
yes, we got the reference here that we have in the annotation. I can do that, then I can also go here and we can zoom in on it. That's kind of cool. So anyway, yeah, I, I, I'd love to talk about that more, but we ran out of time. So anyway, um, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to talk and and, uh, and I encourage you to try it. If you go to editor.visualsa.org, um, requires you to create an identity. You can use a Google identity. It's called Game of Google, or you can do a simple username and password and, and try creating a desk essay. Um, if you do, there's a link at the bottom with an email. I'd love to hear what your reaction is and what you think about it. All right. Have a one or two quick questions. Okay. That wasn't a good time. What what is the state of uh, completion of this? For you know, if I brought it back to a, a faculty member and said, "Hey, you can use this tool," like what is yeah. the? Um, I mean, it's it's it's. It's buggy. I mean, it, it's a beta version of the tool. I mean, the idea is there, and then we're fixing bugs as we find them, and it's improving. I think to some degree, we're going to probably freeze on version one with what you see there functionality-wise, as I think as we move to this next generation, it's going to be easier to make improvements to the user without trying to be, you know, retain backwards compatibility. So I suspect when it's all said and done, we're going to have a, a version one that's pretty much what we have now, and that, that's going to live forever. I mean, it's open source, I mean, so you can fork it and you know, you can you can own it, um, or you can wait for another few months when we have version two, and there'll be you know a, a lot better usability features in terms of authoring and such. Uh, yeah, um, I'm wondering for the accessibility roadmap remediation stuff, and this might be too tricky, so <laughs> say so. Um, but I'm wondering if you have strategies you're already considering just from experience I've been struggling with how to handle lots of dense paratext in a way that doesn't bombard screen readers, right? And that you can, so I'm just wondering, just yeah. preliminary, do you have any it's strategies? Expertise, but I, I've been told that you know, this is a little bit of a challenge to accessibility. You know, things like alt tags on the tripwise images, that's something that you know, I have to kind of work with a little bit, but. But the other issues, yeah. So we need to have a comprehensive accessibility audit and just try to improve what we can. But fundamentally, it, it is a challenge. Gotcha. Fair. Uh, thank you, Ron. Okay. Thank you. Right. Uh, up next, uh, we have Laura Morial and Sean Gilsdorf talking about from manuscript to transcription and back again. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Morreale, and I'm here with Sean Gilsdorf and also with Sarah Powell, who is uh, works at the Houghton Library. Um, I want to thank uh, thank the organizers of today's IIIF conference um, very much for um, allowing us to present our rather unorthodox paper at this meeting of IIIF Active Scholars. Um, we'll be talking about from manuscript to transcription and back again. And originally we said we were going to be closing the virtuous circle with the Houghton MSL uh, um, LAT5, but in fact, we have not quite yet done that yet. So um, this is really a report from the field. Um, it's not a polished presentation and it's not a finished product, um, but it's really a slightly messy use case in media stress, a study of a IIIF project in action, undertaken um, really with the best of intentions, and if I might say so, uh, a rather entrepreneurial spirit. So thanks for hanging in with us today. Now, what we want to share with you is our experience of using IIIF materials to make something. In this case, it was a collaboratively created edition of a text found in a medieval manuscript in a project that involved students in Sean Gilsdorf's spring 2022 Latin paleography class here at Harvard, along with other outside participants who were interested in just joining in on the effort in the transcription. Now, when you decide to make something, whatever that thing might be, you always need to gather get together your supplies, you need to ready your workspace, and to plot a pathway to completion and approach um, that we took with, with our collaborative edition project. 
So today we'll be walking you through those steps and revealing some of our motivations and actually some of our, our missteps along the way. So what we'd like to mention, first of all, is that all the materials that we chose for our class, uh, our class project, were local. That is, they were all based here at Harvard uh, as a part of the university's knowledge ecosystem. The manuscript we chose to transcribe and edit, edit is just a few, few buildings away at uh, the Houghton Library. Um, and it's cataloged, as I said, it's MSLAT 5, and it's delivered online via the library's IIIF's delivery system. Since the manuscript is housed at Houghton, we were able to access years of accumulated knowledge kept by curators concerning the physical attributes of the manuscript itself, which would in turn help us as we undertook our project. Sean and I as medievalists and as digital humanities practitioners brought our own approach to the task at hand, including uh, a template for um, our transcription, um, sorry, a template for our digital workflow that I had employed for longer transcription efforts. Um, the norms that Sean had established in his own paleography class, our own knowledge of medieval texts and hands, and finally,